the book of Acts, we're going to look at chapter 4, the book of Acts, chapter 4, and I'd like to preach this morning on this question, is there salvation in any other? Is there salvation in any other? Acts chapter 4, I'm going to begin reading in verse number 1 and read down to verse number 12. Verse number 12 is our main uh, text of scripture, but we're going to read these verses to help you to understand the background of what is taking place here. Acts chapter 4, starting at verse number 1. The Bible says, And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them, and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. Verse 5. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes, and Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Verse 11. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Is there salvation in any other? To give you a background of this story and what's leading up to this story, in the book of Acts, of course, the book of Acts is the Acts of the Apostles, and some have called it that it should be really named the Acts of the Holy Spirit because of the work of the Holy Spirit. You see, back there in chapter 1, if you look back there just a second, in Acts chapter 1, we find here that Jesus, after his, uh, after his death and burial and resurrection, and uh, in Acts chapter 1, he meets with um, the disciples there on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is the place over in Jerusalem where if you've seen a picture of Jerusalem and you see that golden dome in the middle, most all of those pictures are taken from the Mount of Olives. So there is a valley in between. You stand on the Mount of Olives there and you look through the valley and then up and you can see the whole city of Jerusalem laid out right before you. It's a beautiful view from there. In fact, uh, both of the trips that I've made to Israel, uh, when you're coming to Jerusalem, you come up first to the Mount of Olives. Uh, which would be on the eastern side. You come up there and you stop at the Mount of Olives and then you take a lot of pictures because it is a beautiful view from there. This is the Mount of Olives where Jesus stood right here. And we stop right there on the top of the mountain and we get out and, and uh, if you remember the picture when we went just recently, some of you remember the picture I showed of Pam kissing the camel. <laughs> Or should I say the camel kissing pan was right there at the Mount of Olives, all right? And uh, we, you know, that's where they give camel rides and things there, and there's a lot to do, but it's a beautiful spot, beautiful spot. And uh, here's where Jesus was with his disciples on the Mount of Olives. And as he speaks with them there, we come down to verse number 8 in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, a very familiar and powerful verse of Scripture. It, uh, Jesus promised them, you're going to receive the power of the Holy Ghost, and you're going to be witnesses, <coughs> excuse me, witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. 
he repeats again the commission that he gave for them um, as the first church, this is what you are to do. Be a witness for me. Go out and tell people what you saw and what happened and the death, burial, and resurrection, which is the gospel. Go out and give the gospel. This is what he's saying. And so in, in chapter 1 we see this. And then notice in verse number 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. As they stood there, Jesus began to ascend and lift off of this earth. And the Bible says a cloud received him out of their sight. And they stood there gazing, the Bible says. Can you imagine what was all going through their minds and their hearts? And if you look at this and you read this, you, you see that they probably thought that Jesus was going to go up uh, to heaven for about 10 minutes and come back down. But no, he ascended and he's been gone now over 2,000 years. But he said, if I go, I will come again. Amen. Can you imagine that that was going through their minds that he's going to come again? When's he going to come? Maybe we have a, a, a few hours here. Maybe we have a few days. And the angel appeared to them and said, why, why do you stand here gazing? This same Jesus which was taken up shall so come in like manner as we've seen him go. He's going to return someday. And so they went up from there. And the Bible talks about they met in an upper room and the Holy Spirit came upon them and, and filled them. And in chapter 2 of Acts, we see Peter, as he goes out now full of the Holy Spirit, he goes out and he preaches this message on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And the Bible says 3,000 people got saved as he went out, Peter went out with the power of the Holy Spirit and preached and 3,000 got saved, Pentecost. What a great thing that takes place. God empowers his church to go out and be witnesses. And then we come to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3 is the story of Peter and John going up to the temple. Um, just after the, the Pentecost, they're going up to the temple. And there's a lame man there. And they healed the lame man. And he goes about praising God. And that really brings us up here to chapter 4. In chapter 4, as we have read, verses 1 through 4, we see the arrest. Here, the, uh, the Christians, the people of God, Peter and John and others, uh, they began persecution. And so, in the verse, first four verses, we find that uh, at the temple, these religious people, they arrested them and said, you know, you cannot preach in the name of Jesus, and the persecution begins. I'm sure that they're reminded of what Jesus said. In John chapter 15, Jesus said unto them, Remember the word that I say unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. And so he warned them ahead of time that there's going to be persecution come. And so we see this taking place. And then in verses 5, down to verse number 12, which we read, is Peter's address to them. Peter talks to them and explains. Uh, notice the question that's given here, verse number 7. As they began to talk, notice they ask this question in verse 7. And when they had set them in the midst, this is uh, Peter and John, put them in the midst, they ask, by what power or by what name have you done this? What a question. What a question. That's, that's almost like this. Tell us how to be saved. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Tell us. What is the reason for this? What is the purpose? What power or by what name had he done it? They knew that there was a supernatural power that took place here. This lame man getting healed at the temple. By what power? What name had he done this? What a question. And then we see the answer in verses 8 through 12. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them. Now he answers the question, and in his answer is this verse number 12. Where he says, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Amen. What a statement. What a verse of scripture. And what power. There is no salvation in any other. 
Peter gives them this exclusive answer. And I want to look at this answer, really starting at verse number 8 through verse number 12, and look at these scriptures and preach on this. Is there salvation and any other? Look at verses 8, 9, and 10 again. I want you to notice my first point is this, the exclamation of salvation. The exclamation of salvation. He exclaims salvation here in verses 8, 9, 9 and 10. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost. Notice this. He was filled with the Holy Ghost. Now you say, preacher, what does that mean? What is that talking about? Well, uh, when we get saved, we receive the Holy Spirit. That's part of salvation. When you come to Christ and you receive Christ as Savior, you confess your sin and ask for salvation, you receive also the Holy Spirit when you get saved. <clears throat> and by the way, my friend, the Holy Spirit never leaves you. Amen. He is there all the time. Why is it that after you get saved, uh, you, you look at things differently, you have a different perspective, and when you go do the things that you used to do that are wrong, you feel a conviction down inside. Why? That's the Holy Spirit of God saying, hey, you shouldn't be doing this. He instructs us, amen? amen? We preach from the Word and we learn from the Word and reading the Word of God and studying and hearing it preach. Uh, we get educated on the things of Christ, but also the Holy Spirit educates us on some things. And He lives within us and dwells within us. But this filling of the Holy Spirit, it's, uh, some men said it's the uh, you getting more of the Holy Spirit. No, you already have the Holy Spirit. I like what the preacher said. It's really the Holy Spirit getting more of you. Being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. It's kind of like this. A good illustration is this. At your house, if you live in town, you are hooked up to the water main. The water is always there. When you go to your faucet, you turn your faucet on, what do you expect? When you turn your faucet on, it's not for turning the lights on. That's over on the side, the switch. When you turn the water on, you expect water to come out of there. That's what you expect. And, uh, it, it, you know, as, as Christians, we have the Holy Spirit all of the time. But if your house catches on fire, uh, you don't want to turn on the spigot and throw water with a cup out to try to put out the fire. What do you want? You want the fireman to come hook up to the fire hydrant, which has more pressure and more power, and put out the hoses and water down the house and put the fire out. You know, it's kind of like us as believers with the Holy Spirit. We're always hooked up to the water main. He is always there for us. But there are times in our lives where we need to see his power. Amen. We need to see the filling of the Holy Spirit. We need to see the Holy Spirit do something in a miraculous way. And in a powerful way. Here's what Peter had, as the Bible says in verse 8. He was filled with the Holy Ghost. Said unto them, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. He begins to speak to them. I want you to notice here that he was filled on the inside. The power of the Holy Spirit took over Peter. And what did it cause? It caused it to flow to the outside. Being filled with the inside causes it to flow to the outside. When we have the power of the Holy Spirit and when we are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, it's going to automatically flow to the outside. Here's what he does. Being filled with the Spirit said unto them. So when he was filled with the Spirit, he's ready to speak. He was ready to say something. And so he spoke unto them. Notice what he says as he talks here. He says, you rulers of of the people and elders of Israel, look at verse 9. If we this day be examined of the good deed done to the infinite man by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all. I like that phrase. I want you to know this. I don't want you to question. I don't want you to doubt. I want you to know something. Peter had the power to confront them. Now just remember, it wasn't too many days before this that those same rulers and chief priests and everything brought Jesus in to the trial and, and they plucked out his hair and they beat him in the face and they had him whipped with a cat of nine tails 
and crucified him to the cross. And now, Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, he confronts them with what has happened. Look what you have done. Be it known unto you. It kind of reminds me, back in your Bible, um, if you want to turn there, it's back in the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, chapter 3, we see these words again in Daniel chapter 3. And it was when the, the uh, what we call the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were told to bow to the king's uh, idol that was set up and worship that idol. And they would not worship that idol. And they wouldn't follow the command of the king. And the king said, if you don't worship my idol, you're going to get thrown into the, uh, into the fiery furnace. And they wouldn't worship because they believed God. So, again, they were found out and brought before the king. But I like what they say in Daniel chapter 3, verse 18. But if not, now they said to the king, God's going to deliver us. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king. Same words that Peter said, be it known unto you. They say here in Daniel chapter 3, be it known unto thee. I want you to know this, and I want you to have no doubt about it. Be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. We're not going to bow. We serve God, and only him. Amen? Don't you like that statement? Be it known unto you, O king. Now, I don't care what you say. And I don't think they were being disrespectful, but they were speaking for God. And any king should bow in the presence of God. Amen. Amen. Be it known unto you. We're not going to bow to these idols. Back here in the book of Acts, this is what Peter says in verse number 10. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, everybody, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified. That's a powerful statement. Don't you think that angered these chief priests and rulers whom God raised from the dead? You thought you had the power and you thought you, you were so strong you put him to death, but God raised him from the dead. What do we find in this? The cruci the death, the burial, and the resurrection. We find the gospel right here. He gives them the gospel. Whom you crucified, whom God hath raised from the dead. Even by him doth this man uh, stand here before you whole. It was the power of Jesus Christ that healed this lame man, this, uh, this man that needed a touch from God. It was God that healed him. Now, God used Peter and John, thank the Lord for that, but it was God that healed him. And Jesus Christ is God. And they were saying this without any uh, question or any uh, doubt in their minds. It was Jesus Christ. They exclaimed it, salvation. I want you to notice secondly, my second point is the explanation of salvation. The explanation of salvation. It comes to verse number 11. Now Peter says something here. As he's making this statement unto them, he kind of wants them to understand, verse 11, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Now they understood that. These religious people understood what he was talking about. They had talked with Jesus about being the cornerstone and, and, and the stone which, which uh, the church was going to be built on. These religious leaders noticed this, this stone they had set at naught. What he was saying to them was, they had rejected Jesus Christ, the foundation of salvation. They had said no to him. Now let me tell you this morning. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. Every person. But if you reject him, then you say no to his payment for your sin. And you stand before God in your own sin. I don't want to stand before God in my sin. I want to stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? And so what he says here is something that is referred to several times in Scripture. If you would uh, keep a, a marker there and go over with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 2. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 and look at verse number 20. 
Ephesians 2.20. The Apostle Paul talks about this. He says, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. You see, salvation's foundation is Jesus Christ. It's all built on him. It's all because of Jesus. And there's no salvation in any other. No other way. You go down there to verse uh, Ephesians 2, verse 21 and 22. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. We find the Trinity here. We find Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, whom God hath put together, verse 22, God the Father, and through what? Through the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's the work of the Trinity. The foundation is Jesus Christ. This is salvation. Is there salvation in any other? There's no other chief cornerstone. There is no other foundation of salvation except for exclusively Jesus Christ. Amen. It's only in Him. You see, in all of this, these points and the introduction and everything leads us up to what he's talking about in verse number 12. And that's my third point. My third point is this, the exclusion of salvation. The exclusion. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that people are excluded from salvation. No, salvation is for everyone. It's for everyone. No matter where they come from, what language they speak, how rich or how poor, salvation is for everyone. Amen? Amen. 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 We believe that. We preach that. We know that. But my friend, the exclusive is this. There's only one way to get saved. Only one way. It's for everybody, but you don't say, well, I'm just going to get saved my own way. By doing my own thing. You know, that started way back in the book of Genesis. When Cain brought his offering to God and God said, that's not what I require. Sure. That's not what I require. He said, go back. Go back and bring me the right offering. And Cain refused to do it God's way. And when you refuse, you don't have any salvation if you refuse. Sure. You have to submit yourself to what God said. And so it is limited. There's only one way to be saved. It's, it's kind of like this. If you drive up north uh, in the summertime on 77, well, not this year, but forget 2020. Let's throw it out here, okay? <laughs> Let's think of other years, okay? Better year. And you get off near downtown Cleveland there, and you can get on, you can go and see the Cleveland Indians baseball stadium. And you say, I'm going to go see a baseball game. But I'm not going to get a ticket, and I'm going to get in my own way. <laughs> you think you're going to get in? No, they have guards out there and people watching. If you're going to go to the Indians ball game, you go the way they say, or you don't go. Right. Amen? You buy your ticket, you give your ticket, and you go in to see a baseball game. That's it. If you try to go any other way, you're a thief or a robber. There's only one way. Well, if we apply this to religion, some people would say, well, that's not fair and that's not right. Hey, that's the way it is, right? Amen. God said, I have a door to salvation. And that door is Jesus Christ. Amen. If you don't go through the door, you don't get saved. That's, that's the exclusive of salvation. Where will you go to find salvation? He says in verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other. There's no other. There's no other name that you can go by. For there is none other name under heaven uh, given among men whereby we must be saved. Let me show you another couple of verses of scripture. Turn with me, John 3, 36. John 3, 36. Notice what it says here. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. That's a pretty simple, basic statement, isn't it? He that believeth on the Son, capital S, speaking of Jesus Christ, hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. 
If you don't go God's way, you can't be saved. And you're going to be under the wrath and judgment of God in hell for eternity. That's it. It's exclusive. Turn over with me to the book of 1 Timothy. Uh, let me see here. 1 Timothy. And look at uh, chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And look at verses 5 and 6. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 5 and 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. There is one God, there is one mediator, and that is Jesus Christ. There's no other way. There's no other person that you can get saved by. There's no other name that you can get saved by. It is limited, salvation is limited in its source, but unlimited in its course. It's limited in the source where you get salvation is by Jesus Christ, but it's unlimited in its course. Why? Because it's for everyone, any person, anywhere can be saved. Only in Jesus Christ. Salvation is in his name. The Bible says there in verse 12, neither is there salvation in any other the word any there is speaking of the fact that it's not even one. No other. No person can save you. No government can give you salvation. No church or denomination can give you salvation. It's only in Jesus Christ and Him alone. No doubt about it. Salvation from sin, death, and hell. And salvation to righteousness, life, and heaven. Have you come God's way? Have you trusted Jesus Christ God's way? Or are you trying to look for your own salvation your own way? Well, I'm going to tell you something. Any other way that you try is going to fall short. You're not going to make it. Friend, when you stand before God, it's only in Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's the one who came. He's the one who shed his blood. He's the one that gave his life for us. And if you try to go any other way, you, you can't make it. You're just not going to make it. There's no salvation in any other but through the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you try to come any other way, it's not going to work. It's only in Jesus. Our salvation is not in a program. It's in a person. And that Amen. person is Jesus Christ. Amen. Now let me ask you this. This message, these disciples, full of the Holy Spirit of God, went out and gave this message out. Hey, Christian, are you giving out this message? This message, only one way to be saved. People might be religious. People might tell you, well, I'm, I'm this religion, I'm that religion. Share Jesus with them. They could even say, I'm a Baptist. Hey, being a Baptist doesn't save you. Being born again saves you. Amen. Being a Baptist doesn't get you into heaven. But being saved, being born again, trusting Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. Have you trusted Him? Are you giving out this glorious message? Amen. 